All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to start up after our break. And what I just saw and experienced in the room next door is exactly why we're here in person, connecting, meeting, shaking hands, exchanging cards. I have at least four more in my pocket than it this morning. So moving on to the next session, moving to DocSF Science, this new segment. I'm very, uh, very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Fabrizio Billy. He's a PhD scientist interested in biomechanics. Uh, in motion at, at the UCLA, and he's joined our team and has been with us for several years now uh, dr driving. So without further ado, Fabrizio, turn it over to you for, to kick off science, our first ever. Hello, everybody. Here we are, science, the segment uh, you've been waiting for, so I'm sure. So uh, we'll, do, we'll bring you the latest literally the latest papers that have been published in the last year, um, hopefully to show you what's going on in science, but also to uh, get a glimpse of what's coming next. Uh, we're doing uh, things a little differently from a normal uh, scientific uh, symposium. Uh, in fact, we won't have the authors of the papers that we'll be discussing here, but uh, a formidable group of panelists. So here, how uh, we are going to proceed. We have four segments, uh, two for uh, um, today and two for tomorrow. The first two are AI and robotics, then sensor and XR. We review 368 papers. It was uh, pretty tough, but well, we made it. With the help of 10 senior, 10 faculties, and, uh, and some residents, which I thank very much. They were very helpful. They uh, really deserve a round of applause. Um, we selected down from these 368 papers only um, 12, so three papers per segment. And we'll be discussing these papers. Uh, our panelists will uh, highlight what was going on and uh, why they like it or they don't like it. And finally, we will have some award, the only one of these three papers per segment will select it for an award. So uh, this is how the segments will uh, be divided. And we have a 30 minute segments. Uh, we discuss three papers and uh, a brief introduction, a focus discussion from the panelists on, uh, on the papers. And then the last part will we'll take from those papers and try to uh, discuss what's gonna be uh, the next 15 years. There's also uh, a little bit of participation from your side, actually. Uh, you're gonna be a fundamental part of this because your vote will select who's gonna be the winner, uh, who we are gonna award. So uh, you will see on Slido uh, 2037, uh, you will have to respond to, you will have, you know, you will ask to respond to these three questions. How do you think this paper will impact your work? Knowing what's possible, does this research change how you prepare for the future? And then which of these paper, papers rocked your world? So you can do these um, as the papers are presented or in the end, uh, as you please. Uh, but please remember to do it. So today, um, the other moderators with me should have been Valentina Pedoya uh, from UCSF. She couldn't be here because someone in her family just got COVID, so she thought it was safer not to come. And here are the first two panelists for the first part on artificial intelligence. Dr. Peter Schilling, please join us. Peters from Dartmouth of Hitchcock, here he is. And Thomas Peterson from UCSF. All right. Uh, Peter, you wanna say a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah, just uh, very happy to be here, to be the uh, clinician uh, with the real scientists. So I know just enough to be dangerous when it comes to machine learning. So uh, interrupt me if I say something foolish. Uh, but, uh, yeah. You want to say something about you? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Peterson. I'm the uh, director of UCSF REACH for chronic low back pain at UCSF, and also the director of the uh, Laboratory for Digital and Computational Health Sciences. 
in the orthopedic surgery department. Uh, I do uh, machine learning and deep learning, and I also work uh, in close collaboration with a lot of clinical collaborators. So let's get to it. So the, our first paper is predicting spinal surgery candidacy from imaging data using machine learning. So the objective of this paper was the optimization of the referral process. Uh, and so the authors developed an automated model that predicts whether a patient's spinal stenosis warrants a surgical evaluation uh, from a specialist, by a specialist. You guys want to start? Yeah, I can uh, I could add the uh, clinical color. I can sort of imagine this group of folks getting together and coming up with this paper. Uh, surgeons like to operate. And so really it is about uh, referral of patients to clinics. And of course, uh, having a clinic full of operative candidates is, is very nice for someone who likes to work with their hands. Um, uh, but of course, there's other components to this as well. If you've got a clinic where you've got uh, non-operative candidates there, well, you're taking a spot for someone who uh, could benefit from an operation. So um, they're uh, essentially utilizing MRI only to try to assist in this referral process. And uh, I'll let Tom talk about the specifics of the machine learning that's applied in order to do this. But in, in short, for a clinician, it is allowing uh, us to locate the levels of the spine to make some measurements there regarding stenosis and then using those measurements to uh, get some idea of whether or not this patient might be a candidate for a decompression, um, which would be a laminectomy or possibly a discectomy. They eliminate actually fusion. Um, but I'll let Tom talk about the, uh, the clever approach. Yeah, so I really appreciated this paper. Uh, it's, it's, it's very clever. Uh, so what they did is they trained a, a deep learning model off of 100 patients from a previous study. Um, and they predicted uh, whether or not these patients from this new study of 140 patients were going to end up needing um, surgery or, uh, or not. Um, th their, their final area under the rock curve was 0 0.88, which is uh, great performance. Anything above 0.75 is pretty good. 0.88 is quite good. Um, uh, I think this would, uh, this paper, uh, the, the real innovation here is that they used uh, deep learning to predict this. Uh, I thought that the, the performance was really good. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't possible to uh, sit there and ask a clinician, do you think these people are going to get uh, spinal surgery in the future, which would probably be the ground truth of how well does it do versus a clinician, or possibly uh, how well would a clinician plus an AI team uh, would, would do compared to an AI model. Um, but yeah, I think that this was a really great paper. Perfect. And uh, what do you think, you know, what were the difference between what's the current practice, uh, you know, and that this paper highlight? Yeah, so I'm a joint replacement surgeon. I got to say, uh, reading a lumbar MRI, uh, not, not like my favorite thing in the world. You can imagine a referring physician who is a uh, primary care physician. And uh, even with an MRI that looks, well, I don't think it's a problem, but I don't really know for sure. You're going to want to refer them to the spine surgeon to weigh in on that. So if you've got some additional number to give you a little bit more confidence about what you're doing, I could see real value in that. Uh, just a little more security that you're doing the right thing. And Tom, what do you think uh, would be the evolution for you know, this research? Where do you see this going? Yeah, I see uh, machine and deep learning models like this expanding into the, into the future, possibly uh, you know, uh, 10 years from now. Uh, this will be a, a lot more common. Um, not necessarily uh, machines working by themselves, uh, but uh, possibly with doctors who have uh, actual expertise here uh, that can maybe uh, guide the system in certain ways. Uh, and like I said, this was trained off of only 100 patients. You can imagine in five or 10 years, we might have thousands, tens of thousands as electronic health records uh, include this data more frequently and it becomes more accessible to researchers. I would say that that's also one of the things that I, I look at with this, though, as well, is there's, there's a lot of, I mean, this is a very clever and well-done paper. I really like it. There's a lot of papers that have predictive models, and usually in the conclusion, and they're, they're not wrong, um, that, oh, you know, we can use this model in clinical practice, yada, 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 case closed. Um, this isn't prospective data. Uh, it's not actually in the workflow. 
Uh, I think the way they define the cohort, they're pretty tidy about it. They did a little massaging to, I think, probably make it look a little bit better than maybe what it would look like if you did it prospectively. Um, and I think it's sort of a call to like, how do, you, how do you get these things actually into clinicians' hands and then evaluate them? I and mean, that is a huge step. So a lot to be said there, long conference. So what will be uh, the difficulties of implementing these model into the clinical practice? You know, we heard uh, the, our first speaker, Nicola, that was pointing out you know, some difficulties in, in putting these into clinical. What, what do you think, guys, you know, is the, the issues, are the issues? Yeah, uh, so tools like this ultimately need to be tested with a prospective randomized clinical trial. Um, uh, because, you know, as you mentioned, this is a, a sort of a retrospective data set. Uh, and also, trust in general in AI machine learning models needs to be improved. I'm sure I don't need to tell the people in, in this room about how uh, sometimes you, uh, clinicians don't necessarily trust these models or uh, know what they're doing a lot of times. Uh, you know, it's, it's the black box problem is still very real, and in the future, maybe we'll have better ideas of how to tease out how the black box is working so it doesn't uh, act in ways we don't like or understand. Yeah, I think uh, you just have to be careful when you release it into the wild, uh, that you should release it and study it and do it in a really controlled way. It's an experiment. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how people will react to it. Um, it. There could be edge cases, corner cases, where you're like, actually, this is where it really breaks down, and we didn't know that, and someone made a bad mistake because they interpreted the number wrong, or you know, it was just one of these situations where it made a bad prediction. So that, that would be my thought, is a very controlled fashion. All right, ready to move to the next one. All right, so the next one, feasibility of machine learning and logistic regression algorithms to predict outcome in orthopedic trauma surgery. So the objective of this study was to compare logistic regression and uh, machine learning methodologies using data sets published studies of musculoskeletal trauma to address the following study questions. The first one, do machine learning models produce better probability estimates than logistic regression models? And second, are machine learning models influenced by different variables than logistic regression models? All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what Tom has to say about this. My, my evaluation of it, I guess I'll just say a couple things. I mean, you haven't read the paper. Well, maybe folks have read the paper. It, it's sort of like word salad for folks who maybe don't have a background in it. So it's pretty intimidating at first. Um, there's maybe one part I like about it. And then a lot of parts that kind of like, I'm like, wait, what, what are we doing? Uh, why did we do this? Um, I, I, let, me, let me sort of sum it up, though, clinically, that there's all sorts of outcomes in medicine and in trauma surgery, obviously, where you care about a binary outcome. Mortality. Did you die? Did you not? Complication. Was there an infection? Was there not an infection? And I don't know. I mean, I have umpteen papers that use logistic regression. I was pretty proud of them at the time. But um, now, I don't know. Maybe that's just not as cool anymore. Uh, and and I, as a correction of the title, I don't know why they say logistic regression is not machine learning. In my book, it's machine learning. I mean, it's the final layer in a uh, you know, deep neural network. So you know, or pretty close to it. So um, what they're trying to say is, look, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. And, you know, people, you know, there's, there's all these different ways. And, you know, we're looking at one part of it, which is if you do it these different ways, do you get a more accurate result? Um, and that's kind of the thrust of what they're talking about. But um, I'll hand it over to Tom because I bet he's itching to say some things. There's some real problems with the way they approach it that really bug me. They don't talk about trade-offs. Yeah, uh, so I will agree that logistic regression is a machine learning method, um, but sometimes people who are, say, in uh, statistics fields think it's more of a, a traditional method or a commonly used method. Um, I think that the reason that people like it a lot more than what people tend to refer to as machine learning is because it's very simple, right? So you, you, you do a regression and you look at your beta coefficients and you have a really good idea of what each of those variables are doing and how they're contributing to the model. Uh, machine learning, uh, sometimes not so much, and if you get into neural networks, probably not. Um, so, and that's really what they're looking at here is, uh, can we use a really simple logistic uh, regression model uh, to get about the same results as some of these more complex models that we don't always know what they're doing inside? Uh, and that's what you're looking at here in the, the figure on the right, is that uh, each of these models, as compared to uh, the logistic regression, uh, 
have about the same uh, uh, performance as uh, logistic regression. So anything that's on the, the zero line there is, is the same. Right? You can see that uh, uh, the decision tree uh, at some points may have done a little bit better, but that's not statistically better. Uh, so all these methods that they tried, uh, and they, they had um, uh, one prospectively collected trial and uh, uh, four, uh, retros uh, eight retrospectively collected trials. And they were looking at different things. Some of them were looking at uh, adverse events. Some of them were looking at specific diagnoses. Um, uh, and uh, for all of them, uh, logistic regression performed about the same, right? So for this instance, you would probably prefer a logistic regression example. Um, that's not to say, though, that uh, if you used more types of data, um, you might not get better performance with machine learning. Um, for example, uh, in the previous paper, we just saw they uh, did a UNET on a bunch of uh, MRIs. And if you have uh, uh, an AI system combing over MRI data, you might actually get better performance than anything you would get from logistic regression. Uh, but you know, uh, this is actually a really good point to make here, is that uh, simple models sometimes are best, especially if you're not doing really complex things like uh, needing deep learning on uh, medical imaging. Yeah, I, I, uh, I totally agree. Uh, as a model becomes more complex, it becomes less interpretable. And so, as you're saying, a logistic regression is, it, it feels a little better, like you can interpret it a little bit easier. I just think there's different tools for different instances. And then, uh, and there's these, these trade-offs, which is interpretability and complexity, uh, trade-off as you use more complex model, greater risk of overfitting. It really depends on the circumstances. And I, I know that I see a lot of papers review them where there are questions that have been asked before and addressed with logistic regression, and then they essentially do the same t thing, sometimes use the same data set, and then do something that fits with machine learning. And I'm like, well, it's not, I don't know, it's not that much of a contribution. Now, if you're analyzing, as you said, medical images, different story. All right, so I think we had a clear picture of uh, you know what this paper was about and uh, where it's going, and and I think you know you you need to be careful which kind of model you're using depending on the situation, obviously. So the next paper is a little uh, different, if you want, uh, is the use of synthetic IMU signals in the training of deep learning models significantly improves the accuracy of joint kinematic predictions. So the objective of this paper was to develop a methodology to generate synthetic kinematic and, um, and associated predicted IMU signals. Uh, the train a net neural network, uh, uses synthetic data to predict three degree of freedom joy joint rotations of the hip and the knee during gait. So let's, let's get to yeah, I, uh, it, here's the way I understand it. This is really not my wheelhouse, and I know <laughs> Stefano loves this stuff, sitting next to a real expert here. The way people walk matters. People walk a lot of different ways, and if you have a condition like arthritis or you know, a tendon tear or some other movement disorder, you're going to walk differently. And that's really valuable information. And the way that traditionally you'd get that is you bring someone over to a human performance lab, gate lab, got all these things that I don't understand, and then watch them walk, and yada, yada, yada. It's expensive. It's kind of clunky. It's great for research, but it's not great for clinical work. So uh, what folks are doing, Stefano, this guy over here, uh, can you use sensors? And I won't, I won't steal the thunder on sensors. Um, but the, getting the data from the sensors to then map that to something meaningful about gate, that's all great. It's hard to get the data, and it's a common problem in all of machine learning is like, you need a ton of data. So what do you do? And I'll hand it over to Tom, and I want you to explain how, how this isn't cheating. <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, so this is also a really great paper, which is why we selected it. Um, uh, it's, it's not cheating to create synthetic data sets. Actually, I'm a big fan of synthetic data sets, and this paper it really exemplifies why everyone should be. Um, I have been guilty of having a very small data size before. Uh, you know, this study only had 30 individuals uh, from which they had uh, several thousand um, uh, strides that they were studying. Uh, in the end, what they, what they did uh, is they had three individuals that they used as a testing set, which is also very small, right? But they have many, many strides that you can understand in those three individuals. Uh, so that being said, uh, that this, this data set itself suffers from uh, uh, lack of data. Uh, this is very common. 
And like I said, I've, I've, I've done similar things in the past too in my research. And what's really nice with this paper is that uh, they used uh, uh, machine and deep learning models to uh, predict uh, joint and hip kinematics. And what they showed is that if you use just the real data or just synthetic data, uh, meaning uh, they, sort of, uh, they sort of warped it in, in certain ways to, to make it look a little bit different than the original data set, or if you use real data and synthetic data together, actually the best performing machine learning model is using real data and fake data together. Uh, this is sort of a, the concept behind uh, bootstrapping, right? So if you don't have enough data, you make up a bunch of data that looks like your data. And this in uh, the field of computer science and machine learning is known to increase your performance. And this is what this is, right? It's just making up a bunch of data that helps you increase performance. But what's really nice about synthetic data is that you don't have to give up your data. And your synthetic data, once you make it, uh, can be non-PHI data because it's all synthetic and, and fake, right? So institutions that previously couldn't collaborate together can now join their synthetic data sets together and make large and larger data sets, right? So, and that's why I like this paper is because it's showing that if you have synthetic data, uh, even from your own data set, it can increase your performance. So imagine now having data from other collaborators who don't necessarily want to share their data, but you can take their synthetic data and increase your machine learning model performance. This is going to get really big in the future. This is the whole concept behind uh, you know, electronic health records not being able to be shared between institutions and you can make synthetic data sets. Uh, and this is sort of a way that they've done it uh, by making a way to warp and represent the data in different ways to make synthetic data sets, which has been successful in this paper. Not cheating. Not, Not cheating. cheating. Well, uh, you know, synthetic data is also very used in the pharma industry to create uh, what they are now doing with in silico trials. So they are uh, scanning for the best drugs before investing a lot of money into real clinical drugs. So did you guys remember to vote and, uh, and express your comments before we move to uh, a discussion, a more general discussion? Actually, I'll, I'll add one thing, if you don't mind, because no, it segues, uh, I, I think it dovetails with what Tom was saying, is that I think so many of these problems, it, it does come down to a team science approach. Uh, there's just not going to be enough data if, unless you come up with clever ways uh, to work together. Federated learning being another approach to that, where you don't have to mix the data. Very complicated, very difficult, can't pretend to understand it, but it seems like a reasonable thing to talk to Tom about it. <laughs> okay, so did you guys vote? Uh, can we see the Slido results or on the screen just for a moment? Guys, can we? No? Maybe? All right, so intrigued. Okay, good. Very nice. I like Oli. Welcome, Oli. That's fantastic. Okay, so. This speaks to the institutional trust and trust of AI algorithms. That <laughs> That's nice. All righty. Okay. So, and then you'll vote for the paper so that we can select uh, the final uh, winner. Remember, that's important. Okay, here you go. Well, we have a winner. <laughs> Synthetic IMU signals. That's our winner, it looks like. All right, so you can change these data until. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, so can we go back to the slides, please? Perfect. So, okay, so we have seen, uh, you know, a prediction and optimization process, definition of the most appropriate models, and uh, the role of synthetic data. So, if you don't mind, guys, you know, uh, take us on what you think is going to happen in the next 15 years. Peter. Ooh, that's a, that's a really tough question. Uh, I'll just answer with a, a little uh, sort of spin on that, which is, um, anyone know what Dornbusch's law is? It actually doesn't pertain to tech. It, it was actually, I think it was a German economist, and he was commenting on a policy change. And he said, uh, um, it will take longer than you think for the policy change to take effect. But then when it happens, it will happen faster than you can possibly imagine. 
And I feel like with this sort of thing, that's kind of how it is. I feel like there's been a lot of predictions. Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. The radiologist losing their job. I don't know. I, I haven't seen that yet. Um, but uh, there will be a tipping point, is, is my guess. So hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Tom? Yeah, 15 years is a pretty far time away. OK. Um, uh, I think that humans in general are pretty bad at predicting the future. Uh, but the good news <laughs> is that machines are pretty good at it in some cases. But not all the time, and that's why I, I don't necessarily agree with this. Uh, uh, the um, people on their phones and the computers actually learning. You know, we as humans we learn too, and we can learn how to utilize these tools to you know augment doctors and clinicians with AI tools that they want to use and understand how to use and understand what it's doing. You know, in the future, I, I do think that these uh, tools are going to be more commonplace, but they definitely won't replace your jobs. They're going to make it easier. They're going to make it more accurate. You know, a human in the loop is always going to need to be there. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, AlphaGo was just beat by uh, a team of the AI AlphaGo and also uh, an, a Go expert. You know, so it, it's been shown time and time again that uh, you need a human in the loop to actually beat the machines when they're doing things wrong because they're doing, you know, they're machines. They don't always understand. I don't think we're going to get over that hurdle, especially in the next 15 years. But again, humans are pretty bad at predicting. Right. So um, there's always been uh, some sort of disconnect between the technical side and the clinical side. And some of that is also due to a different language that you know, sometimes is used. How do you see these evolving into, you know, because right now, obviously, the AI expert and the clinician are working more and more together, uh, neck to neck. And uh, so that their understanding of the different language is going to become better and better. So how do you see these evolving? And yeah, what, I, is, what roadblocks you see in that? Yeah, I, I do think it is um, very easy to see this as, as an outsider, as, as kind of magic pixie dust. And, and, and I think to some degree where, you know, folks are enthusiasts and, you know, companies that are keen on it are, you know, a little bit guilty of this. And I do think that that is a bit of a disservice. At the end of the day, it's math. And, uh, you know, one, one doesn't have to understand all of the details of the math to get some of the, you know, conceptual big picture uh, uh, things that are, that are really important to pushing the ball forward. Um, I, I do think there needs to be an emphasis on material that is written for clinicians that adds some clarity about these concepts in a big picture sense. There's some, but um, I think uh, more of that would be very helpful. Tom, what do you think? Will AI translate into clinicians' <laughs> language? I don't think it necessarily has to. Uh, I think that uh, in the future, if you guys start using AI tools, it's going to be because you want to. You know, it's it's you guys are going to be speaking the language that you speak, and then the AI is going to have to adapt to that, or at least be useful to you in certain ways that's going to make you want to use it. You know, and maybe one day in the future, you know, that's what we're here to figure out. What exactly do you need? Do you need something that's going to give you better predictions of uh, adverse events or length of stay in the hospital or revision surgeries? Do you need something else, you know? Uh, and really imagine in your head what you would use these tools for to make better prognostications of the future. Uh, and then imagine a way better version of that because right now it's not that great. I'll, I'll add two things along those lines. Uh, automated EKG reads. I mean, any orthopedic surgeon here probably kind of kind of likes those. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I could uh, read an EKG very well without it, but that's been around a long time. I think it was developed in the 80s, uh, and I'm sure it's gotten a lot better. But that, I don't know, I mean, it didn't put cardiologists out of a job. Uh, people use it all the time. I know I certainly do, at least to sort of get an idea, is there something troubling or not, if I happen to ever have an EKG in front of me, which is once every probably seven years. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so I, I just don't, I don't think that the threat is quite as great as, as sometimes it's made out to be. Tom, Peter? Thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you. All right. So we are ready to move to part two. Are you ready, guys? Uh, fantastic. So I would like to invite to the podium Stephen Kuretzer and uh, Jennifer McKenney. So Stephen Kuretzer from Innovate Orthopedics, Texas, Houston, Texas. And Jennifer McKinney from UCLA. 
Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but when you asked earlier if there's any foreigners here, I thought I was from Texas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. sure. My name is Stefan Kreutzer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, I have a strong passion for robotics as well as outpatient total joints. We, uh, about three years ago, opened a, a, open, a uh, outpatient total joint center. We've now completed over 1,400 same-day discharge uh, total joints, and it's going very well. Um, another passion is healthy healthcare economics, so kind of the impact of that. And I think one of the questions that we'll probably address today is, you know, how do we manage reducing healthcare costs in an outpatient setting, but still maintain the highest quality possible with technology such as robotics, because the reimbursement is certainly less in an outpatient setting, and so can we afford buying, you know, million dollar robots? and how can we uh, create the value proposition for that? Jennifer? Yeah, thanks, Fabrizio. I, Jennifer McKaney, uh, also from UCLA, uh, down in Los Angeles. Great to be here in San Francisco. I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I oversee innovation at UCLA Health, as well as sit on our, our value analysis committee and evaluate new technologies as we look at bringing them into the health system. In my other hat, I oversee UCLA Biodesign, which is our early stage healthcare technology innovation program. And once upon a time, I wrote a book chapter on surgical robotics, so I'll, <laughs> I'll see what I can add to the discussion today. Great. That's fantastic. Let's start then. So our first paper, gesture recognition in robotic surgery with multimodal attention. So the objective of this paper was to improve the analysis and uh, fine grain segmentation of surgical motion. Uh, not an easy task. And the goal is to overcome uh, the complexity of articulated instrumentation trajectories and the inner variability due to surgical style and patient anatomy. Stefan. Yeah, it was an interesting paper. Um, it's fascinating how much data they, they combined here in order to, to look at motion of instruments and gestures. Um, uh, I usually go to the conference in Houston on, on robotics that has nothing to do with orthopedics and, and the Outside of orthopedic robotics are much further advanced in analyzing things like that. And I think it's very important in order, to, because when you look at robotic surgery, it, it lengthens the procedure. And so if we can create efficiencies in fewer hand movements or fewer people movements in the operating room or doing things at the same time, to analyze this with, with large data and AI, I think it's very, very important to move this field forward. Because again, we've got to be efficient in the operating room. It's important to get the patient in and out. And so I thought that was an excellent paper. And hopefully, we can draw some value from the research that they're doing in, in laparoscopic robotic surgery to open surgery like we do in, in orthopedics. Jennifer, yeah. what's your take? So I'll, I'll say that you know, we're looking at applications of, of laparoscopic surgery within the orthopedic space for the context of, of this specific paper. When I looked at the the queuing in on the kinema kinematic piece of this as we're looking at kind of the entire operative procedure from pre to post-op and within the actual, you know, we might have those incremental savings during the procedure, but is it going to be enough to move the needle in terms of the, ad the added benefit? And so I look at where is the, the value capture potentially from looking at these multimodal data streams, perhaps it's going to be in the post-op setting. If we look at a revision that was performed with all of this data collected, then we might be able to go back and see what were all of those different data streams. Can we analyze that? Should we have looked at a different implant position? Should we have looked at another specific variable if we're looking at revision? And I, I think we'll get to this a little bit later in the other paper when we're looking at the um, arthroplasty paper, specifically looking at revision rates. However, there's certain things we can control with robotics and some things we can't control. So, can we control patient selection? Can we control certain aspects of soft tissue management with robotics? Potentially not. So how does that play into the pieces that we discussed in this paper? Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. So, and um, what do you think is the impact on the outcome here that something like this could have on the patient outcome? Yeah, so I recall one paper having read on motion analysis in urologic surgery, and they noticed that certain hand movements had a lower incidence of urinary, I think, uh, urinary retention postoperative. And so uh, this kind of analysis, can you say, you know, if you do it this way, 
you may have more soft tissue damage with a longer recovery phase with a worse outcome. And if you do these kind of motions, then you're more soft tissue sparing or more gentle on the soft tissue, which then can improve clinical outcomes. So correlating this, this kind of analysis um, and then seeing whether it impacts outcome, I think is, is huge for the future, but that may be answered in I'm sure the question yeah. you're going to ask later in 15 years from now when we really <laughs> uh, are down, but very much so. It's absolutely true. So what was that really impressed you about or not impressed about this paper? Yeah, I think it's a good question for Brizio because I, I look at these and I think, okay, is this a me too? Is this incremental or is this transformational? And you know, to me, this is an incremental improvement potentially in the procedural execution of robotic surgery. However, how could we potentially reframe it to be transformational? Um, and when I look at that, it goes back to that surgical data science realm where maybe we can use this and not even to change the, train the robot, but maybe to help better train the surgeon when we're looking at VR, AR, or other immersive technologies for training and, and some of those finite surgical gestures, maybe we can help provide that. And I don't know if we want to get into the utility of haptics today, but maybe we can provide some kind of closed loop feedback there on the front end, or like I, I mentioned earlier on the revision piece. Or put a shock call on the residents if they're moving the wrong way and they get zapped, right? <laughs> that, that would work. All right, well, I think- I think they only allow that in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly we do, yeah. Okay, so ready to move to the next mm -hmm. one? Yep. Okay, so this one is autonomous uh, uh, robotic laparoscopy surgery for intestinal anastomosis. So the objective here was to enhance the autonomous strategy for laparoscopic and soft tissue surgery and demonstrate that robotic laparoscopic is mobile anastomosis in phantom and in vivo intestinal tissue. Peter. Yeah, I mean, a fascinating paper, probably one of my favorite ones, even though I had a hard time understanding some of the technical aspects of it. But um, I currently work with an autonomous robotic company, uh, Think Surgical, what we do knee replacement autonomously. And it's very simple. We put a pin in the femur, we put a pin in the tibia, nothing moves, the robot comes in and, and makes the bony cuts. And even that seems to be like way outside the box when it comes to orthopedics. So to develop a system that has a, a camera and is inside the body cavity with a human or a, this, I think there was a, a pig, right. that actually there's motion because the pig is breathing and being able to sew a moving target and doing it successfully and then testing it postoperatively for patency I thought was fascinating. So, so when it comes to the three categories, I think this is a, a game changer. Um, you know, the main advantage of autonomy is that you eliminate the variable of the physicians because there are some surgeons that are very talented, there's some surgeons that are less talented, there's some surgeons that are very experienced, there's other surgeons that are less experienced. And an autonomous robot eliminates all of that because it does exactly what you want it to do. And so to be able to, to do that inside the, the abdominal cavity and, and do an anastomosis, I thought was fascinating and, and very well done. And an enormous amount of work, uh, you know, from a camera system, from tagging things to make sure that it's tracked properly. Um, uh, I, I thought it was a great paper. I won't ask when the Think Surgical paper is coming is coming out, but I, I I would agree that this was really exciting. You know, second paper that we looked at out of the three that's outside of the field of orthopedics, but how might this have transformational? And for me, Fabrizio, using my my three bucket scale, you know, this falls in that transformational bucket because it is advancing the field. This is, of course, within the abdominal cavity, but as we look at sort of, again, in my, my non-clinical view, but you know, there's opportunity for more gross motor movements within orthopedic surgical procedures. And so how do we look at this in terms of refining that? Again, whether we're removing the surgeon or actually looking at um, potentially minimally invasive procedures in the orthopedic space. You know, we're looking at um, ligament repair or other procedures where this kind of fine motor movement would really yield potentially, like we talked about, outcomes that are gonna move the needle, uh, whether or not it's gonna take longer or be shorter, um, I'm not sure, and we'll, maybe this is in the 15 years discussion, but how many robots do you need in the room? 
um, is another question that, that we need to talk about. Yeah, they actually have two KUKA robots, uh, which is the medical robot. Yeah. And do you know how much a, a KUKA robot costs, one of those arms? Say 250K? No, no. it's $85,000. $85, so that's the list price. So it, what's interesting is that robots are actually not that expensive. It's because we do them in such small sizes and it's the application of the robot. And so, you know, one of the review articles on the KUKA robot, the medical robot and different applications. So there's definitely opportunity to use robots and do it cost effectively. So what are the challenge that you see in uh, uh, translating these more, uh, you know, openly into other surgical? It's a good question, and I think Stefan and I talked a little bit just this morning in terms of, you know, you have open and closed platforms, and then how do those work across the OR or within different fields even? And so when I look at the entire space, how do we think about that enterprise level robot, whether it's gonna be Da Vinci or maybe it's gonna be someone else, but, or if we're just gonna have the Makos and, and all the others that are competing within the same field or who's gonna compete across the field? I think would be a really interesting question. Yeah, and a good question about open platform. And it, I almost envision is that, you know, they've proven one surgical procedure and that's an anastomosis. And they've created a system that can do that and it's mostly, you know, things off the shelf like a KUKA robot. Wouldn't it be great in 15 years where we have a system like this, and then just like the iPhone app store, different companies can develop different processes and different surgical uh, challenges, plug it into this robot system, validate it, and then you have another application. Then if you have one robot and you can do 15 surgeries with it, then the value proposition is totally different. You know, with Mako, we started with one robot, one operation that's done rarely. That's not a good value proposition. Now Mako has a uni, a total, it has a, a HIPAA platform, so it has more applicability. But if we can create systems and then have other companies, and that's why an open platform, in my opinion, is so important have other companies plug into that system where we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time um, as a defensive play as all the device companies do now. Um, I think that's where the future goes. Sounds good. Let's switch to the third paper. Robotic assisted surgery in medial unicompartmental knee arthroplasty. Does it improve the precision of the surgery and its clinical outcome? This is a systematic review, but um, we thought it was conveyed a, a good message and a good opportunity for a discussion, and it was a good review. So, Peter. Yeah, so th that's finally a paper I understood. <laughs> <laughs> the other two I was like, God. Um, it's, a, it's a great review article, and it, it brings up some really good points. Um, you, you know, you, when you develop a robotic solution, you have to show accuracy. And accuracy is really defined by dimensional accuracy and positional accuracy. And this was a systematic review looking at, at accuracy. Precision is, you know, do you, can you reproducibly put the implant in the, in the same position? So they looked at precision there as well. And then they looked at clinical outcome. And what was amazing about the, the, uh, the paper is that it really did not make a strong argument for robotics. Um, and the papers that they, you know, they looked at a lot of papers and there were very few randomized controlled trials. And so I think if the robotic field in orthopedics wants to survive, they really need to start looking at much more randomized controlled trials. The second thing is you also gotta look at, you know, you can be highly accurately incorrect and while in uni, I think we pretty much know where to put the implants, in total knees, we really don't. We still argue, is it kinematic alignment? Is it mechanical alignment? Is it three degrees external rotation? What's a safe varus cut on the tibia? And we really need to create this feedback loop as to define where do you need to put the implant back to 
clinical outcomes. So that we can then say, okay, yes, we have these fancy tools that are very accurate, but we need to be correct. And so I, I think that that paper really brings up a good, good challenge of robotics that we as physicians and you as device companies need to address and, and come up with a solution so that the committees that you sit on or that you host and somebody else wants to, you know, some surgeon wants a $1.5 million robot, you know, you got to show value. Yeah, I, I, would, I would just preface by saying I 100% I agree that this is probably one of the most comprehensive reviews out there in terms of sometimes I, I'm a little ambivalent about these retrospective reviews, but this is really everything that's out there. And I think it's a good starting point for the field in terms of saying, what do we need to do to show the utility and show the value? When you looked at survivorship, survivorship specifically within the context of this paper, there was one specific subset within the cohort of about 12 studies that they looked at. I can't see that from the front. I know, that's, I that's okay, because I. I, I did my homework. <laughs> one of the specific cohorts that was a sample size, about 57 um, patients, when they looked at the difference in revision between robotic-assisted and, and surgeon-performed surgeon procedures, they saw that within the robotic-assisted group, there were no revisions associated with alignment issues. However, within the physician, um, we don't call it physician-assisted. Conven conventional. Conventional, conventional. Yeah, conventional uh, surgical surgery, there was actually 86% of the re revisions were associated with alignment. And so again, it goes back to what can we control with robots? What can't we control? And positioning is one of the things we can control that Stefan exactly. talked like about. Cementing technique, we cannot. So, you know, early failure is poor cementing technique, most likely, uh, and not alignment. You know, alignment has an impact maybe later on as far as wear and, and possibly, you know, offloading and so forth. And so it's, it's you know, I, I thought it was an excellent paper as well. What about the implant tolerance? Correct. And that's a good question. You know, it's, we have cross-link poly, we have vitamin E poly. You know, can we put these things in upside down and they still work? Uh, maybe not, but there's certainly the tolerances are much higher. Um, but I think, it, again, we, you, know, you know, I always talk to people, my hips run marathons, my knees don't. So there's a lot of improvement on knee replacement, and I think robotic is the solution for that. But we've got to prove the clinical efficacy and outcome. All right, so here we are. Let's think what's going to happen in the next 15 years. I love that question, and I, I was glad you asked it earlier because I could put a little bit of thought into what I think will happen in 15 years. And in a perfect world where I see myself uh, with robotics, I think there is, number one, we have to define the target. I think we need to prove that robots are accurate. And then we can change the implant design. You know, currently all the implants that are used on the market are 10 years or older uh, of the four top uh, uh, companies. And the reason why we don't change the implant is because it's very costly. And so can we develop a system where you can get a preoperative CAT scan in the clinic, you can optimize the surgical plan for that particular patient that is based on their activity level, their alignment, and their needs. You can then 3D print an implant in your back office, sterilize it, and then use a robot to implant it, and then two weeks later they can run marathons. That's what I envision will happen, and I hope we get there. Perfect. I'm going to come see you in like 60 years. <laughs> so the marathon. Uh, I think there's a few different pieces of this to, to take apart, but I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, the idea of like the surgical app store, right? And so how do we get there? How do we get to kind of the broader field of medicine and looking at robots that have utility across clinical service lines? But then before we get there, we have to think about the healthcare economics piece because there's, there's different modalities that companies use to sell into the health system. Okay, the robot's gonna come for free, it's gonna be a leasing model, it's gonna be a, a big capex up front. And I think that's gonna to continue to change and, and evolve as I, I see colleagues from ortho coming, ortho spine coming and say, you, we won't say the name, but so-and-so is giving us the robot for free. Okay, well, what does that mean? And you know, is that, does that mean there's a healthcare economics component here or not? Um, but going back to what you said, Stefan, I think was really interesting in terms of 
you know, 3D printing in the back office. And there's companies taking off different pieces of that. I think about Carl's Med, they're based down in Southern California, right? They're 3D printing the spine implant, they're doing the preoperative planning, they're sending that personalized implant to the surgeon. And then pushing that a little bit further, and then this goes back to a little bit of that real world evidence piece, that maybe we can link back to that robotic surgical environment in terms of what Canary Medical is doing with the tibial implant sensor with the, the Zimmer knee, the Persona mm -hmm. IQ, yep. right? And so when I look at that field of data and we're starting to be able to close the loop from the personalized implant to the real world evidence that's gonna be collected after the implant, again, does that data that we talked about that was incremental earlier all of a sudden become transformational because I'm getting those early real world evidence gate whatever it is following the surgical procedure. Yeah, yeah there's nothing free, right? You, we all get those emails, you know, sign up with T-Mobile, get a free iPhone, and then you go there and it's really not free. It's just you, you pay over it uh, on a monthly basis, right? But, it, you know, we currently spend 18% of GDP on healthcare, and it's predicted to be 20% of GDP in the next 10 years. And so it's a, it's a cost uh, acceleration that is unsustainable for the U.S. healthcare system. So first of all, nothing is for free, and second of all, you gotta look at the value proposition, and it has to be a zero-sum game. So if you bring in a robot, something else has gotta give. We cannot increase the cost of the procedure, especially with the shift into the ASC, because you get paid less in the ASC. And so, you know, can we use 3D planning and robotics in order to uh, improve the current process, delivery process of implants? Like right now when I do a total knee, they bring three instrument sets and they bring a full set of inventory for every case that I do. That's not an efficient management of resources. With 3D planning and robotics, you can eliminate 80% of the instruments and you can eliminate 90% of the inventory. That's a cost saving to the device company. So can we create better delivery models with robotic solutions that not only creates a zero-sum game from a cost standpoint, but then also improves clinical outcome? And that's really where the future needs to go in robotics. Thank you. This was really good. Please, round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, so you were yeah. intrigued, uh, most of you at least, so that's great. Eh, very good. No. <laughs> okay, so perfect. Okay, we'll uh, let you know where you can read more. You, you just have to ask. We have a lot of papers that you know, we can provide you with and, and a lot of resources. There you go. We have a winner, Robotic Surgery Precision. Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow. So the basic science. The basic science is, uh, is phenomenal. It's, it's coming. It's going. Uh, we just wanted to give you a flavor for that. We uh, had this line that Shana came up with, which is the, the science, uh, the data that supports change, the data that, that allows us to move forward with conviction. Uh, and that's what we're trying to show you. But to move forward conviction, you also have to have in your back pocket the skill sets necessary to drive transformational change. Digital transformation is the, uh, the work that uh, our next speaker does on a daily basis. Um, he says that he defines the future of what is possible for work, which is a fantastic way to describe your day-to-day -day work. He leads strategy um, for uh, smart health experiences at EY Global. And fun fact that I saw on your resume, I love this. Also, a good friend of our friend, uh, another pilot, is that he started uh, as an RAF pilot uh, way back when, flying over Scotland, I hear. So please welcome Kenny O'Neill. I think, I think somebody was asking if there's a foreigner in the room. That's me. So um, yeah, not a local accent, originally from Scotland. Um, as my friends like to say, an interesting career where I started off flying jets in the Air Force back home and then had to grow up and get a real job and uh, moved into healthcare consulting, that classic career direct trajectory. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about the work that we do in the market. I'm gonna talk about human-centered design, but how it then evolves into systems thinking. Because I think, I think a lot of the time in healthcare, we tend to drill down on, you know, really kind of specific points, but then lose the, the interconnectedness of the challenge that we have to deal with. So there's three things we're going to talk about today. 
Um, understand human-centered design and its applicability with some cross-industry examples. We're going to learn the foundations of systems thinking and how it relates to human-centered design. And then we're going to do a little bit of a envision the future health system, the 15-year view through our point of view, if we work what we were doing, and we kind of, I'll tell you more about that at the end, because um, it'll be interesting to see your feedback on that. All right, we're going to start with a little exercise first. So if you can all close your eyes, and three, two, one, what do you see? I see a blue, dress, a blue stripy dress with kind of black in between. Can I have a show of hands who sees that with me? <laughs> That's the exact reaction I was waiting for. Who sees something different? You said you saw something different. What do you see? Golden white. Anybody else in the golden white bucket? Yeah, okay, let's, let's move on. Let's do another one. Okay, close your eyes again. Three, two, one. I see a gray sneaker with kind of terrible turquoise trim. What, what does everybody else see? Does, who, who sees what I see? Yeah. Does anybody see something different? What do you see? Pink sneaker, sneaker with white trim. Is there, uh, is there any others? Does anybody see anything else? Same? Pink and blue? Okay, so what I'm just trying to show is the same thing can look fundamentally different to different humans as we go through things. You know, it can just be as simple as, you know, um, a sneaker that looks different to everybody. And as you heard, I, I grew up in aviation, so I'm not, I wasn't like a formally trained human design, centered design thinker um, or human factors, but once you get into this environment, you have to start thinking about safety. How do I operate with the technology? How do I operate with another human? What does the information coming to me look like? How do I impart that? And then how do I operate in the bigger system of the air traffic control. Um, this is a seaplane coming into land. I think it might be in the Maldives in Mali. So it's, uh, yeah, that's the retirement job I want to go for. But um, yeah. So then let's talk about the journey that I went on. Um, human centered design didn't really touch aviation, you know, early on. I mean, just look at this cockpit. I mean, seriously, like it makes it really, really hard to digest the information and actually understand what's going on. And actually, it's pretty dangerous because if you're zipping along at seven miles a minute at 250 feet, trying to interpret that, if you're onto a loser, to be perfectly honest. But you know, I've, I've, when I've come into healthcare, I've been in operating rooms, I've been in ICUs, I see the same thing. I see all these different um, dials, displays, everything else just all mashed up. And you know, it's just, it just doesn't play to the high reliability. So the journey I went on, and, and I really got quite deep into this within the Air Force, was first of all, right, what can we do with what we have in place? So you can see here, we put a multifunction display center of the cockpit, and then we widened the head up display, and then we made it possible so that all the actions I wanted to do could sit on my throttle and my um, cyclic that can sit there. That was a game changer because not only was the, the, the symbology designed for me to understand really quickly as a pilot and improve my capacity, but I could do everything still looking outside the jet. But secondly, I could then be more effective in this system, the interconnected system of the other jets, the people on the ground, and we could operate much better within this new ecosystem that we were building. And then, if it hadn't been for that pesky kidney stone, um, I would have probably ended up in something like this. Where, and, and it goes back to what we were just talking about, that human um, technology interface has been designed so well that you don't really have to worry about flying this thing. It basically flies itself. What you're now looking at is the information in a really good way to be part of the system, to make the system the most effective system that can work for Whoever, whatever outcome that you're trying to get to. So that's a little bit on my journey. So human-centered design is building things for specific users and getting their input every step of the way. I think this is another part of healthcare where, where over the years it's kind of like, yeah, we asked the patient um, or we asked the provider, 
and then we went off and built something for four years and then came back and it didn't work. You know, why, why is that? It has to be a continuous process. You have to be engaging your users, you have to be understanding, you have to be working in an agile fashion, taking things back to them, testing it with them. Because, you know, what do we say? No plan survives first contact with the enemy. So you can't, do, just don't take that long-term kind of waterfall method. We need to be thinking about how we continuously engage the users on this journey to really drive a fundamentally better way of developing human-centered design products, ways of working and systems. Um, and we also need to be unapologetically human. Keep the human at the center. And the reason I say human is because there's many humans across the pathway of care, not just providers and patients, it's administrators, it's social workers. Always think of that real multidisciplinary cohort of people, keep them in the middle. And when you start thinking about human-centered design, think about it, viability. Is there really a business case for this? Desirability, who wants it? You know, who's actually going to use this? Who wants to use this? Who's going to take it? Who's going to scale it? Who's going to be our, you know, change champion when you do this? And feasibility, is it te technically feasible? Sorry, is it technically feasible? But there's another part to this. The, on the tech side, what I find a lot is people say, you can't do that because. You can't do that because of HIPAA. You can't do that because of patient. You can't do that because of X. What we try and do is help them saying, right, fine, but how do we do it? So what do we have to do to make it happen? So tell me how this happens and what do I need to do? Right, I have to change policy. I have to get patient consent to share, share the data. I have to do this, this, and this. So again, really thinking about when I'm designing for the human, what do I do to make it happen rather than what is in the way of making it happen? And then you end up in this kind of Mobius loop. So. When you think about it, and going back to the point I made earlier about um, it's a continuous process, you're going back to the users. So empathize, explore the human context, what's actually going on around you, what's going on in your ecosystem. Define what's the strongest pain points in that, in that environment, what's happening in that ecosystem. And then you start ideating. So what forms can I do at the multiple boundaries of this ecosystem? And then you move into prototyping. Make a minimum viable product. Test it, get it out there, see what people say. And then you just go around the loop again. What's had, what was the effect of that MVP in the environment? Okay, let's do some more research on it. Okay, but we missed that first thing, so let's update it. Because one, I think we must two. Now you do that rapidly to actually get things to market, and there's really good examples of totally you know, managing that MVP and getting it the way care is delivered, so like software in the UK has really you know, fundamentally different pathways by using this method, or um, uh, UTI, you know, based on the UTI pathways, and good like comes. Um, there's a number of different things that we should go into in this. But one thing we have to be wary of when we get into this is it, there's a myth deeply ingrained in our society that there's an average or normal person. Mm -hmm. um, it takes back to this chapter because I'm here with very dapper, you know, put it back on my and it's, um, I'm just going to put it in the Jewish first name because it's the same name as you can tell. And his name is Adolfi Kwekulit, I think. He attempted to find a numerical average for a host of the body measurements, so chest, legs, weight, marriage, death. And he was trying to quantify the average human. Um, and that attempt, it was fine at the time, but actually it created this falsity that average is a good way to design around, which it absolutely isn't. It, it doesn't work, you see that kind of 80-20 rule there. We have to think differently. Um, we really need to think about the extremes when we're doing this, not the average. So, so think differently, think about the most extreme case when we're thinking about this. So what happens if you do think about the extreme user? Well, if I decide the design for somebody who's kind of challenged to use this, when I give it to a normal bodied person, they're gonna absolutely use it to become a superhuman. It makes them much more effective. You know, the typewriter, the straw, audiobooks, remote control, Google's autonomous cars, you can see there. Um, they were all designed for people with disabilities. 
but they're loved by everybody because they make their lives so much easier or they make them fundamentally more effective in what they do. So let's go into some of those examples. The modern typewriter was invented by Pellegrino Trui. The Italians have um, invented quite a lot of good stuff. I'll give my due to the, the, the nation of Italy. Um, he needed a way to communicate with his blind lover who was unable to write in pen and ink. So he designed the QWERTY keyboard. But that QWERTY keyboard has become ubiquitous across the globe now. You know, so again, designing for an extreme situation and then you draw down to the use for everybody else has been really effective. Um, Joseph Friedman sitting at a milkshake bar with his daughter. Daughter is very small. She's trying to get up over the straw to actually drink her milkshake. And he's like, this, this is just ineffective. I can do this better. Takes a wire, wraps it around the straw. Ta-da, there you go, there's a the bendy straw. So <laughs> it makes a real difference. But then when you take the use cases outside of that, people that are lying in bed, people that are sick, um, we can now use a straw to help them drink better. You know, all these simple things that you can do to think about designs. Um, Sam Farber, his wife had ar arthritis in her hands trying to peel potatoes or carrots or something with this terribly designed vegetable peeler. Well, Sam went, why, why, why do ordinary kitchen tools have to hurt your hands? It just seems ridiculous. So he designed the OXO set of kitchen tools, which are amazing. I've got them at home. They make a fundamental difference mm -hmm. to the experience that you're delivering. Again, designed for a really, <laughs> a really challenging case, but everybody else finds them useful as well. They love it, which helps everyone. And then one very close to my heart, because I, I scraped in on the height rules for being a pilot. Um, in the late 1940s, the US Air Force had a serious problem because its pilots couldn't can keep control of their planes. They kept on crashing. And everybody kept on saying that it was a control problem, but it wasn't a control problem. It was the design of the cockpit. Because they'd taken Quartlet's theory and said, right, we're going to design the cockpit for the average pilot. So therefore, we can you know, have the, everything working around the average. They then went and saw 4,000 pilots. And guess what? They never found one average pilot in those 4,000 pilots. They had to fundamentally redesign the whole ergonomics of the cockpit. Again, think differently. Think for the extreme. You know, design the cockpit for somebody like me who scrapes in like by millimeters, literally millimeters. That was a quite stressful day when I got measured. But um, yeah, that's the kind of thinking that you have to do. Then I'm going to show you a, a quick video now. Um, does anybody know Steve Mahan? First ever self-driving car. Let's watch it. Should be some sound. If not, I can narrate. Okay, so Steve just coming out of his house. He got in his car, um, and as you can see, Steve, Steve can't see. Steve is 95%, um, he only has 5% of his vision. Um, this is him looking, going, look, mom, no hands. <laughs> so, so Steve's in with the, the team within this automatic car, and they're driving around, and he's, he, he's just so happy because it feels as if he's, some of those boundaries that have kept him locked away because of his disability have been moved. Um, I think at this point he says something like, let's go get tacos. So uh, he tells the car, let's go to the taco shop. You'll see in a second that he pulls in. This is him just, just talking about the experience. How it, and, you know, tacos are a good thing, so therefore let's pull in and get some. Um, and you can see the car's really just got the laser on top. It's finding its way. And, and one of the key things about this is that car has given its technology to all of our normal cars now. We have a system driving. So you'll know in your car, it, it keeps you in the lane. It keeps you away from the car in front. You know, it's intelligent. It looks at your, I mean, once some of the cars look at your eyes to see if you're nodding off as well, and they'll wake you up at the same time. All technology coming from designing automated um, cars for somebody with a real challenge. Um, this is him going in. You can see him going in to get his dry cleaning. Just, just. It, this kind of design and human-centered design helps you think differently and helps people move back into roles that they never were able to do. 
But when you think about this, it, there's a secondary effect that has actually saved people's lives because that technology is now being used in the system of motor cars as they drive around the country. Again, getting the human technology interface uh, correct, yeah, even these tacos on the way, makes a huge difference. And this is him coming home now and basically back in and he says, yeah, it, it's, it's absolutely changed my life and this is, this is what we should be doing to help people and, and use human-centered design to drive innovation. There you go, number one. So when we think about that design piece, design for the extreme users and will make average users superhuman. So think about that in the, in the, the, the makeup of our population. You know that 5% of the population that consume a huge amount of healthcare re resources. If we, if we design for the extremes, so think about that kind of multi-morbidity, chronic illness patient with dementia, um, social issues. If we can design for that person, then the next person coming behind them with only you know, one or two kind of issues, it's much easier to pull down from that thinking and that design to actually help those people. And then pull down again for the much lower acuity, bigger population. So again, always keep this in mind as you're thinking about that kind of journey on human-centered design. Now we move into systems thinking. And I've, I've alluded to it already, but and I, I should say I stole this from Disrupt Design because I thought it was such a great slide. So I've completely stolen it. <coughs> Excuse me. Be very honest about that. So systems thinking. We tend not to do this at scale within healthcare. Um, especially, you know, even it doesn't matter if it's government-led systems, it doesn't matter if it's commercial thing um, systems. It just doesn't tend to happen that well. People tend to think in the ways of the disconnected parts of the system. We think linearly. We don't think in cycles. We think about the silo that we're in. So how do I do something in the silo that I'm in? We think about, if it was a jigsaw, we think about our little part of that jigsaw. And we think about analysis on a point of the system, not, not wider. And we think in kind of isolation. But where we should be thinking, as you develop your system thinking and think about the knock-on effect, it's about interconnectedness. It's about circular thinking. It's about keeping that agile thinking going because it's not one and done. This is going to continue as time goes on. It's about thinking about the emergence of all these different data points across silos that we need to understand. It's about putting the jigsaw together, not your one little part of the jigsaw. And it's also about synthesis of all the data points in the system and the relationships that go with them. So I've been really lucky in my career to be able to um, work in many different countries across the world. I've been in the US for the past five years, but really thinking about how, how does technology help systems thinking? How do we play with the care model and redesign the care model to be more integrated to reflect the needs of the population for that multidisciplinary model? Um, and then how do we use the technology to really like curate and navigate the patients through the pathway of care in a fundamentally better way better experience, and lastly, how do, how do we help the providers? How do we take the burden off of the providers? How do we help the providers have less admin stuff across? I mean, I mean for an example, I'm working with a big health system just now, and we're looking at the, the, the core leaders, and we use the nurse manager as the, um, the most complex persona. And these nurse managers are trying to manage their day-to-day -day work across 36 systems. And it's taking up 65% of their time. These are skilled clinicians that should be at the bedside and supporting their teams, and they're not. But actually, if you take a systems thinking point of view and match systems thinking with the human-centered design, okay, systems thinking is these people could be force multipliers, especially in the staffing crisis, to improve patient experience and drive better outcomes. That's what they should be doing, right? So if I'm looking at human-centered design, Let's get them in a room, let's understand their day-to-day -day work, let's job shadow, let's really get that granular view. And then let's think about how we can aggregate what they really need to do into like a mission control function. And by doing that, suddenly we're going to give them back a couple of hours a week, even with just the minimum viable product. That's another couple of hours for them to go and spend on the front line, which is so important just now. I, mean, I don't need to tell this room. So, so really think about how human-centered design then connects up to the system. 
the interconnected system, and we really have to think, think, think bigger about the knock-on effects. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. At EY, we, we tend, to, we think about this a lot. It's one of the things that I really enjoy about how does the system work? How do you bring it together? How does the system evolve? And instead of, you know, blasting a PowerPoint at people, we tend to just use the, um, the technology called Mural, which is usually used for facilitation. Um, but we actually use it to bring all of our thought leadership together about the case for change, population pressures, the economic pressures. I mean, somebody mentioned that earlier on around, you know, $8.8 .8 trillion is spent globally on healthcare, of which 3.4, sorry, no, 3.8 trillion it is now, 3.8 trillion is spent in the US. The US is taking up nearly 45% of the global spend on healthcare. Again, GDP is going through the roof. It's a real challenge. The population's getting older and more complex. By 2030, you will have a deficit of nearly a million nurses and about 120,000 physicians. Now, those stats came before the Great Resignation. Um, so I think it's actually going to be worse, especially with 3 billion people coming online across India, China, and Asian countries that want um, Western healthcare, if you like. So when we think about the human at the center, as you can see here, um, the data that flows around a human, e.g. how do we help make better decisions for what the human needs, because just now we really only have 20% of the health data. There's 80% of the data we need for wellness, which sits outside the clinical record. And then when you put all these bits together and think about digital and platforms, what does that ecosystem look like? So going to the question about what does it look like in 15 years, um, I would say that that's an interesting, an interesting concept because I think what it looks like in 15 years is achieving skill. I think there's already people on the journey towards what I'm going to talk you through just now. Um, but definitely in 15 years, we'll see this at scale because um, people, um, people will have to change. They're just, it's not like you're going to be able to build a few towers and if there's no staff around to, to fill them. So again, a lot of healthcare organizations across the continuum we talk to, we talk about this duality of growth. So having managed a, a, a medical division at Imperial in London for nine months as a part of a secondment, I know how hard it is. It's so operational. There's a firefight every day just to get through it, to manage it, to, to make delivery of great care is really operational and hard. But the world is changing. So therefore, the duality says, at the same time you're doing that, you need to innovate and create a fundamentally different model of care for tomorrow. So you need to double run. And you need to find some way to create the capacity to do that. And when you're doing that, think about the human. Because just now, we're basically reacting to them. We're reacting to give them sick care. If we truly want to lower the cost of care, we have to get into the wellness game. We have to lower the frequency of people going to the high cost areas of the health system. So just now we've got kind of 20% of the data in the care record. We need to be getting the health behaviors. We need to be getting the social data, the behavioral data, and the environmental data. That's the other 80%. And this is what people are trying to do with the platform now. Name check. Yeah, so, so as you can see on the ecosystem that we built there, um, what under, underpins this is the use of platforms at scale. Um, like Ping An in China that has 300 million people on a digital first healthcare system that you basically come in through digital channels, you share your data and then you're curated and navigated to the right place at the right time. Like the Estonia model, you know, blockchain secured, um, blockchain secured um, healthcare system where the patient owns all the data, they can give it on the phone, they give access. There's, there's many more examples. We're building the French one, we're building the one for the largest insurer in Germany. This is happening in different places around the world. Um, the open air platform um, style, so open platforms above EMRs, that is taking off in Europe at a rate of knots. Um, the NHS has just signed up for it in England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, there are actually three different NHS systems. Just interesting fact for you, there is no one NHS. 
Um, so underpinning this future health system is the platform. The platform helps you aggregate data and it also helps you translate the data into the similar data model so you can start using your AI, your machine learning, and your robotics. But so what? You know, it's all about the care model. So let's talk about how that actually affects care. So down in the bottom left, you can see there's primary care, but in its widest sense, um, there's already a deficit of primary care physicians, so we're going to have to think about that model and make it multidisciplinary. It doesn't matter what country you're in the world, there's a deficit everywhere. So how do we use pharmacists? How are we using nurses and nurse practitioners to, alongside the primary care physicians? And at the same time, pulling in specialist expertise to help do minor procedures within that more polyclinic primary care model. But it doesn't really work to change the system if we don't have it really have a symbiotic relationship with the home. So when we're designing this, again, what do humans want? What, if we're making healthcare, what's human-centered design? Well, actually, people quite like being in their home with their family in a safe environment. Okay, what can we do to keep people there? Right, let's make it a smart home. And people used to say, well, oof, you know, especially in Scotland, you know, geez, that's a lot of money to spend on a smart home. I don't want to do that. You can do it for literally a couple of hundred bucks now which is a whole game changer. It doesn't have to be a new home. It doesn't have to be an old home. You can do this with any um, place that people are living. Um, I still remember like one of the examples from, um, we restarted this journey like 10 years ago in the UK. And th this COPD patient was just coming back again and again and again to ED and getting admitted. But the reason was because he was going home to a damp, cold home that he couldn't afford to heat every time. It wasn't his condition, it was, social situation, but once we actually tied the social data with the medical data, voila, right, let's get down, and then he wasn't coming back again. So thinking about that, insights from sensors in the home, um, you know, the evolution, we're seeing hospital at home grow, I think that's just gonna keep growing. So all these different procedures to manage people in their home, um, even 3D printers in their home, for minor, you know, casts and supports, um, after you've done some kind of visit, be it physical or telehealth. So that's the foundation, right? I'm gonna build off of this. This is my um, new primary care model that's primary care, smart home, and it's connected into the social and, and, and behavioral ecosystem that people live in. So I'm, I'm thinking about the human. I'm making it easy for the clinician as, get, as well, because we're trying to use decision support tools to make it easier for them to make decisions, to actually look at um, imaging and get insights from the imaging. But then, you need that kind of quarterback for this system. And that's the bit you can see in the middle of the ecosystem there. That's the digital hospital. Now, these are here now, like version one, version two, different parts of the world. Um, Intermountain, so I was just seeing that the other day. You know, theirs goes from the ICU all the way down to the home. That's what we're seeing in this system. But it's going to be much, much more mature. It's going to be multidisciplinary. It's going to have... Um, um, touch points, it's going to be predictive to understand the longitudinal data trends so that we can see people beforehand and they can direct teams in the community to go and see people in the home. Because, you know, just look at what Amazon are doing with their primary care. You do the digital consultation, but then you don't have to go to the building, they come to you. So that human experience is much better. And this is what I think this is what we're going to see as these generations change rolling through into this new model. Um, at the same time, Payers have a bit of an existential crisis on their hands. Um, they have to show that they can provide value. And just now they're struggling. Um, but I see U the UHGs, the Humanas, the, the Centines of the world thinking about how do I then incorporate the digital hospital and control, of our, and control that primary care into my model to become a pay provider, who actually then become the orchestrator of the system. So there's, there's part of this happening in the payer landscape, and there's also part of this happening in the big health system landscape. Who will win? Open to you. But I think there will be many of these systems operating under you know, a big platform and then localized um, networks um, operating. Um, very of interest to this room is we really do think that the, the out of hospital surgery centers are going to roll up into national scale. That, that, that intelligent um, 
symbiotic relationship that we alluded to between the pilot and the aircraft and the technology. I think that will be the case with the surgeon, the AI, and the robot working together to drive fundamentally better outcomes, more efficient operating processes, and, and, and doing it at scale. You know, really driving scale and better outcomes and lower cost across this ecosystem. Um, one, bit, one bit I haven't heard people talk to yet is um, the precision medicine side of things. Um, so CAR T cell therapy, um, you know, a lot of um, genetically based treatments for long-term conditions. By 2026, there's going to be 600 products in market. So by 2020, 2035, this is going to be scaled. So again, a lot of stuff that goes to hospital just now, oncology, some other kind of complex you know, um, conditions, they won't be going to the classic hospital anymore because a lot of these people will be immunosuppressed. So I'm not going to send them to the hospital because it's full of infection. What I'm actually going to do is introduce a new facility into the ecosystem, the precision medicine facility. You know, that clean facility, that truly digitally enabled facility that I literally come from my house at the right time, walk in, get my blood taken, get back home again. The blood goes through the intelligent supply chain to know where it is, who it is, what temperature it is, who's, who's working with it, and send it back to me at the right time in the right place to get my infusion for my CAR T cell therapy. That's going to be a real change in the kind of flow of patients for the ecosystem in our point of view. So with all this activity shifting around this new ecosystem, what happens to the hospital? Um, we're already starting on this journey. Uh, we did a project with Erasmus in the Netherlands to reduce their capital footprint and actually start weaving in computer vision in rooms, um, artificial intelligence within the operating rooms, um, use of digital tools for the patients and providers to really take the admin burden of you know, just getting to the hospital, getting admitted, and getting back out again. You know, taking the pain out of that because at the same time, with the staffing crisis we have, we really don't want nurses following up by phone on post-surgical patients. You know, is that really the best way to do it? We should really be thinking about, there's a digital layer that, that works with the patients initially, and then if you really kind of, if a patient says, my pain scale's off the chart, yeah, then we can speak to people. So again, a lot of the work within this ecosystem is trying to move these people back to the proper license, be it a social worker, be it an orthopedic surgeon, be it a nurse practitioner. We don't have enough people. So let's enable everybody to work back up their value chain towards the top of their license and drive better outcomes and really bring the cost of care down. Because the way that I, the way that I say this in, in another slide is, imagine a high frequency, high amplitude wave. Thank you. I'm doing this. That's where we are just now. We're not going to stop people going to the hospital in high cost areas, but what the wave looks like in the future, with the, the, the amplitude being the acuity level, is the amplitude comes down because we're getting to people earlier. So therefore, we can have therapeutic solutions for those people. And the wave length extends because we're not going to go to the hospital as often as we do just now, because literally it's, it's kind of a free for all just now. Because you see somebody, you know, you see somebody once a year or twice a year, and then when you feel ill, you just end up going to the ED because the ED is a proxy for primary care in many different places around the world. So if we do this right, this ecosystem starts to generate real-time data. And this is what's happening in the Manchester area of the UK just now. This is what they're piloting. Um, so that real-time data is translating into real-world studies to show the outcomes and the effects of these new clinical models. So there's a real opportunity to, you know, not get stuck in randomized control trials for years, but actually use real-time data to get real-world studies and make great decisions from that. There's another example in, which you look at is Canterbury in New Zealand, starting this journey a long time ago, 10 years ago. Um, and they basically suffered a massive earthquake where they lost about half of their hospitals. But because it started on a very, very early version of this, they coped. Because they'd already said, right, the community in the home is key. We need real-time analytics to show what we're doing is right or wrong. And, and they used it. And they coped while they rebuilt their, their health system. Um, and the last bit is um, funding. Um, we, we definitely think there's going to be a push towards away from fee-for-service significantly 
And we think that's going to start in a couple of years because the Medicaid trust fund runs out. So the policyholders are already looking at what's going to change in Medicaid from fee for service to more of a bundled or episodic payment. Um, hospital at home, we're seeing in the market is more um, trying to work around that 30 day bundled payment. So we're seeing more initiatives towards, well, value-based care, but I just call it normal payment models because that's what happens in most of the rest of the world. Um, you're kind of episodic payment with maybe some kind of top up for outcomes. But we really do see a, a real push um, at this point, a significant, firstly, more episodic slash value-based care. And I think the government will be paying for more of this care as well um, because of social pressure. I think um, there'll be a big push around nationalized healthcare by this point when you think about the, the generation coming through and who's voting. So that's a um, quick overview of human-centered design, how human-centered design then ties into system thinking, and then our thoughts from the work we're doing in different places around the world and here around how that ecosystem might look in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, that was exceptional. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Extremely well designed, well delivered. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the questions, towards the end, it was becoming clear that the future is here. It's just not distributed evenly. We're, seeing, we're starting to see elements of it, maybe not in the United States, maybe other countries. Mm -hmm. One statistic that just blew my mind is 50% or about half of the world's healthcare spent, dollars are spent in the United States. Yeah. Like, that's interesting. Um, I was wondering if you get something very practical, something about human, I want to get back to the human centered yep. design piece. Yep. And give me an example of one uh, hospital system or group that you work with where you can, you can point to one human centered design uh, approach that really yielded a uh, positive outcome, a good uh, transformation, especially if it happens to be a digital transformation. Yeah, um, I can talk to, um, um, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you the name, but uh, I'm not a, west, a west side of the US multi-state um, hospital association that um, starts with an E and ends in Robbins. <laughs> um, they, they, so, so like all healthcare system I've been in, onboarding of staff is terrible, terrible experience. It takes a long time, it's messy, nobody knows where they're going or what's happening. And the, the system we were working with was losing staff because of it, both in the onboarding process and then a very high rate of attrition within the first three months. Now, what, and, and the, going back to the systems thinking um, thing, um, remember the one on silos? Yep. You know, people thinking in silos? That's what was happening. They were thinking, well, IT has to solve this. Well, no, the business has to solve this. And we went and had a conversation. There was two new hires from Microsoft in senior levels in the IT department. And we said, listen, this is, this is a human-centered design problem, right? You're not designing this process for the people that are coming in. You're not understanding the personas that you're dealing with. And actually, you don't have anything to connect the dots across this, this journey, this system journey. So what we did was do ethnographic research. We used a tool called System, uh, 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 sorry, Service Design Blueprint, which basically shows you the experience, the points of contact, um, um, the actions at that time, and then there's like the back of house and how they connect through to the system's use. And long story short, through using that methodology, we took a week off the time to recruit people and get them in the door. Their identity access, so they were, they were starting with the right systems. Because you know, you get in to do a job and you don't have EMR access, which is a bit of a challenge for a physician. Um, and and their, their, their kind of NPS score went from kind of 30 odd to 85. Well, and now they're rolling out across the whole ecosystem. And again, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a clinical side, but I think it's just as important in the environment that we are today with the staffing crisis is to give providers the best experience on that kind of hire to retire journey make them more effective so therefore you get better patient and you know really improve that experience all around well thank you sir appreciate the discussion yeah. human centered design at the, at the center of our digital transformation in healthcare and now we're going to go from the big picture level how do we change the world and where the world is going which is really exceptional to maybe how we're going to do that uh, by looking at a uh, number of companies that are trying to tackle big, big challenges, uh, they call them moonshots in healthcare. Um, 
and, and giving us their vision of where they're going with it. So Startup Health uh, is partnering with us today to do this, and they're an organization that's investing in a global army of entrepreneurs. They have over 400 investments worldwide, uh, all committed to achieving health moonshots. To walk us through this and to bring up their companies, we actually have Unity Stokes, the CEO of the company, also a good friend, and I'm super excited to have you here at DocSF. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to the session. You know, I, I really appreciated uh, the last conversation because um, we really are living, I think, in a, a historic moment uh, in terms of the future of health. Um, and I, th I think it's a historic moment because there's a whole generation of innovators, of entrepreneurs, of builders, of creators at the early stages of, of health innovation that are really reinventing the, the future. So over the next 20 minutes, you're going to meet three of them. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to meet three more. Um, we've had the opportunity at Startup Health, um, as Dr. Binney said, over the past decade to invest in over 400 amazing companies all over the world in 28 countries. Um, so today, we just wanted to dig in um, and really get a sense of what's going on at the ground level, uh, what some of the challenges and opportunities are. So just to kick things off, um, if each of you could introduce yourself, um, very quick background, and, and share a little picture into the vision for your Moonshot solution and, and what makes it unique. Um, start with you, Rich, and just go right down the line here. That's good. Um, now first of all, I have to make sure my microphone's working. Am I on? Can you guys hear me? Good. Um, yeah, so my name is Rich Walder. I'm a physical therapist by training. Um, I work for a company called Joint Academy. Joint Academy is a digital clinic for chronic joint pain or muscle, musculoskeletal, so we're in the musculoskeletal space. It started clinically in Sweden um, in about 2009 or 10. Um, over, 100, uh, over 800 clinics, 1,000 uh, providers trained to give this very proprietary program. We digitized the program in 2014 in Sweden. I was the first hire in the United States about five years ago, so I guess I'm a five-year-old startup. Um, and we've uh, tried to take it to market here. Our moonshot is to be the global leader in musculoskeletal care. Uh, we opened the, the European market. We've opened in France, Germany, and the UK. Um, it is the gold standard in Sweden, um, and we're just trying to get market fit and traction here in the United States. All right, Tatiana. Hi, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for getting me on stage. Um, so 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer, and at that time, I started a company, and the whole thing you know, evolved, but um, the main question at that time was, why me, and how we can use data to predict diseases and find personalized precision treatments and everything along those lines. So um, I'm the founder and CEO of Open Health Network, and we are thrilled to um, partner with Amazon and Miller School of Medicine and design, develop and design the concept of digital twin. And just memorize this term, because everything in healthcare in the future will be based on the digital twin. And digital twin is digital representation of objects. In healthcare, you will see digital twins that will represent people, that will, present, will represent different organs. And this um, digital twin concept will be used for everything, from clinical trials to um, uh, clinical treatments and predictive modeling, and each of you in the future will have a digital representation of yourself that will be constantly evolving and updating on a variety of different data points from your physical environment and everything else. And I'll be, you know, I'm excited about the future of healthcare. This, this sounds very meta, so I look forward to digging yeah. into that. Uh, Salman. Check, check. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All righty. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Salman Khan. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Biotics AI. A little bit about Biotics AI. Uh, we're using AI to detect abnormalities in fetuses, and we're leveraging AI to also help a doctor workload, uh, especially on the reporting side, which I'll get into in a second. What makes us unique? Uh, a couple things. We're the first tool in market uh, to give second opinion um, in the fetal space. 
Um, and the second thing is uh, we have one of the largest labeled data sets in the world. Uh, we've been collecting um, uh, you know, various planes uh, for about five years. We partnered up with four clinics around the world. And as everyone knows in the machine learning space, the more data you have, the more accurate your model is. And uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is that from A to Z, um, everything's organic, and we have um, you know, our doctors collecting the images, our doctors labeling it, and then our machine learning engineers working with our doctors to process that into uh, the algorithms. So you're all working in, I think, completely different areas to a certain extent. And, and as the, the last uh, presenter said, even for the the big payers of the world, it's incredibly hard. Um, it's also incredibly hard uh, to be innovating at the early stages. Um, what do you wish um, every partner, clinician, collaborator really understood about the challenge that you each are, are specifically working on? A little insight to, to that. Yeah, so I think you know, the whole healthcare system has to adopt change, and, and it's, a, it's a system that's not comfortable or isn't used to adopting change quickly. So healthcare, technology moves quickly, but healthcare does not move quickly. And so you'll have a health plan that says, yeah, we want to do something, but we're really not going to help you. And then the, the medical provider groups um, are also aware, but they're not really interested in changing their workflow. So I think it's really, you know, it's not going to be done just by technology stepping in saying, you've got a problem, I've got technology, I can take this. It really is everyone jumping on board. And, and embracing change, and, and everyone has a part to play in that change. Um, if, if you ask me what's the good thing about everything that you know, COVID brought to us, and I would say it's basically forced healthcare to change. And um, we start looking at different ways how we can deliver healthcare to people, right? We were forced to do that. So telehealth and all other things have been, you know, kind of speeding up. Um, and to go back to the digital twin concept, so we're deploying probably the first comprehensive digital twin implementation for um, people with sleep disorders in conjunction with cardiovascular and Alzheimer's diseases. And the thing is cool that um, there is. Uh, a box of devices and sensors that sent to people's home. And um, we also have technicians who collect lab data. We, we also integrate genetic data. So if you look at the person, we're suddenly getting everything from every single breath to heartbeat to um, socioeconomics, such as noise level, environmental stuff, along with genetics and uh, biodata. And with that, we'll be able to build a model that can be used to predictive treatment, for example, in um, the, the best treatment for the person that will deliver uh, the most um, uh, effective outcomes. So um, I think uh, what we need to understand that changes are happening as we speak. And if you will be just waiting, the whole healthcare is changing, um, like, um, primary care, like I was just reading news right now, Walmart just announced the whole, um, you know, diabetes care uh, from Walmart, right? Continuous care at people's homes, data-driven. So if you will sit and think that things are not changing, you will be disrupted, and pr it probably will happen from outside. So, um. yeah. I'll echo what they said. Um, there's a huge problem in healthcare, and it's only getting worse. It's not getting better. Um, just to take a quick step back, the previous speaker, they said that 50% of healthcare spent around the world is in US. Um, check this out. So right now in the United States, the number one, number two reason people die, heart attacks, cancer. Number three is doctor misdiagnosis. Um, and this is according to John Hopkins. Um, and in the OB space, about 50% of structural uh, fetal anomalies go undetected. So we started digging deeper into it, trying to understand why that is. And one of the biggest reasons is there's a huge shortage of doctors uh, in the United States, uh, especially in the OB space. Currently a shortage of 6,000, and that is increasing year after year. It's gonna go to 22,000 by the year 2030. Um, why is it that these doctors are um, staying away um, you know, 
from this space. Um, there's a couple reasons. Uh, one of the biggest reasons we found was they're asked to do a lot with less. And this has been a common theme um, from every speaker I've listened to. Nico was mentioning it earlier and a couple other speakers. But uh, just to give you an idea, uh, healthcare professionals spend about 15, 22 minutes per patient on reporting. Um, and they're seeing about 20 patients per day in the OB space. And that's about six hours a day they're spending just on documentation and reporting. That's all sound techs, nurses, and OB doctors and MFM combined. So that takes away from the patient experience, you know? Um, and because of that, there's a lot of other issues that are arising. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, uh, when it comes to malpractice, um, you know, OB space experiences the most malpractice cases and has the highest insurance premiums. The quality goes down, so on and so forth. So with, with all these challenges, two, two quick things. First of all, where's their hope? Where's their optimism? And maybe do you have one lesson learned from each of your experiences that, that um, may be useful for, for clinicians, innovators, others to understand um, about what is working or the directionally what, what may be working and what you're doing. Right. Yeah, I think, I think technology, um, you know, COVID definitely helped technology. So we had to use it. We had no choice. And so now the, 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 the people I sell to, which is usually the health plans or the provider groups, they're like, yeah, we have to use it. We realize it's necessary. It really, it really did help. And so I think, I think that that has been a, a positive. The challenge is, I think the previous speaker talked about silos. We're still in silos. There was always this tension between payers and providers, and now you're seeing payviders. So I, I think that the future is going to be more of that payvider model to take away some of that tension. In fact, our, our largest company in our portfolio, Devoted Health, is a payvider, and they're, they're just having tremendous success with that, that approach. Tatiana? Um, I think... Everything that we do in healthcare, and previous speaker mentioned that, um, has to be done um, having patient in mind, physician in mind, caregivers in mind. So I think um, it's Im important for us to understand all the different players, how to engage all of them, and how to create solution that will be useful for all the people in healthcare. And the other thing that you know, I'm kind of excited about that we us kind of going away from niche disintegrated things, but that's not uh, what ultimately will be a solution in healthcare. So we will, and we will be looking at the patient in the whole, we will be creating uh, integrated care management teams that will not just look at the patient in context of broken hip, but as a patient at the whole. And um, all of that will play well in the future that was described by a previous speaker, where the payment models will be changed and they will in kind of force us to change how and what we do. Because all those bundled payments, outcome-based, value-based care, they will force all the healthcare organizations to redesign their processes and focus on you know, integrated care and outcomes. Yeah, I agree with Rich. Um, two reasons I'm optimistic is one, um, technology. Technology is growing at a pace that it's never grown uh, before. Uh, 10 years from now, you know, this is gonna be a completely different world. That's my personal opinion. And number two, COVID did open our eyes, and I feel like we are finally listening to healthcare providers, and we are seeing how big this pain is, you know? It's not an issue, like Stanford down the road, they went on strike yes, yesterday. Um, one of the best institutions in the world, Kaiser, they were, you know, um, six months ago, were going on strike. It's, it's a common theme across the country. Uh, in the Midwest, there's 47% of counties don't have a single OB. It's, it's not one of those things that, you know, it's pick and choose. It's 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 a every hospital clinic I talk to, I find a common theme, and I'm happy we're finally listening to them, and we're hopefully going to do something about it. And and as we think globally, imagine how many billions of people have uh, no access to clinicians or doctors or care at all as well. So it, it really is a global challenge and opportunity. Um, Rich, you started to touch on this, but I thought just very quickly, if we're in a new moment. Uh, whether we call it post-COVID or where, wherever it is that we really are, but we have seen 
a lot changed very, very quickly in the past 24 months. Um, where does that leave us in terms of the pace of innovation, what, how we should be thinking about the next few years in the innovation cycle from your perspective, each of your perspectives? Yeah, and I'll go quickly with a little time here. So, you know, we're at a tipping point. Are we, are we going to stay with it? Is the federal government going to embrace it? Or, you know, so CMS opened up and started to pay for digital health care technology. Um, but temporarily, is this going to be the gold standard? Going forward, are we going to keep using technology or are we going to fall back? So that's the, the tipping point, I think. Yeah, um, and again, I, you know, I'm a technologist and have been for a long time, but I always was uh, on intersection of technology and business processes, so I completely reject the notion of deploying technology for the sake of technology. So we need to look at the future of healthcare in connection with uh, evolving payments and everything else, and then look at how technology can help us to redesign how we do things so we'll be prepared for those changes. And that can be done in an agile manner. And we all need to understand that. It's not like technology will be deployed in healthcare in one day and change everything. No, you need to, you know, from, you know, my background is also like con consulting Pricewaterhouse. So we had as is picture, to be picture in an agile way on how you can use technology or just business, you know, change processes and business care to get from as is to be the Key thing is you can't be stuck on as is and think that to be will just magically happen. So our role here is to help you to get to where you want to be in a way that can be done, um, you know, gra gradually. Yeah, really quick. Um, I think the answer is simple. We need to embrace technology. If you look at any other industry, they've embraced it and they've grown immensely. Healthcare hasn't. You see where it's at. And there's been extensive research done on this. Um, for example, uh, at Stanford, Google, AI and doctors working together produce the best result. Not only when it comes to misdiagnosis, but also making everything more efficient. The data's there, it's just we need to embrace it. That simple. I, I loved how you bridged the, the clinician with technology and you all kind of touched on that. So we've got one minute left. Um, bring out your magic wand. Um, let's, you know, dream us into the future very quickly for each of you. What impact has your solution made um, on the world? How do you define that a decade? Yeah, so working for a startup, we just go quarter to quarter. So tw tw 20 years from now, um, you know, I think. Street too. Sure. We got to think longer term here. You know, I think I think care pathways. I think that we we've, re we've redesigned care pathways. So being a musculoskeletal, there's always this talk about is the care pathway broken? So you know, 20 years from now, the right care pathway for people that have musculoskeletal pain. I, I stick to, you know, digital twin. Each of you will have a digital representation, living digital representation of you. We will be able to create a healthy baseline. We will be able to see little things that uh, move you from being healthy to sick. And we will be able to use digital twin to predict what kind of treatment and intervention can help you to uh, prevent diseases or treat diseases. And that's the future. Uh, if I had a magic wand uh, 10 years from now, number one, uh, we're out of time, can I? Okay. 20 seconds, let's Yeah, go. so uh, being proactive, not reactive about uh, misdiagnosis. Imagine, you know, being able to tell certain abnormalities proactively, number one. Number two, uh, streamline the workflow uh, in the OB space. Every clinic hospital has a different workflow. It's not streamlined, which is crazy to me. And number three, this is my personal um, I lost a sibling because of a doctor misdiagnosis. I want to take this technology to third world countries and empower them, um, you know, more for patients uh, 10 years from now. Well, I just want to thank all of you for dedicating your lives to the missions you're on. I'd like to thank all the clinicians and innovators and creators in the room. Um, everything that you all do is so incredibly important. So thank you and, and thanks for sharing your time with us. Go ahead. 
I feel like I need to keep you up here with me for just a little while. Like energy included, batteries included. Like, Can I stay up here? Yeah, I'm just, just gonna, you just, it just makes me feel better when you're here. Well, I, you guys make me feel better. It's the right, smiles. Perfect. Yeah. Th thank you at DocSF for everything that you've done. You've been great collaborators to the whole ecosystem and, and we really appreciate that. So. Awesome. Yeah. And I think very much of your partner, Steven. Steve Krein. And what does he always do? Like gets everybody up we, we around. Are, you have link to link arms, arms, link arms because we have batteries included it's a hard and it yeah. takes a global army to reach all these moonshots. Exactly. And you know what? And if we can't dance and sing together, we cannot solve hard challenges in we healthcare have together. We got to fun and we got to do it together. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you. you. All right.